Hello, everyone. I'm Laura Barger, Chief Marketing Officer at the Financial Health Network. Welcome to day two of Emerge Financial Health. For those who joined us yesterday, welcome back. We had such a terrific day with so many thoughtful and inspirational speakers. I'm excited to be kicking off today's activity with this session, Integrating Financial Health into Your Company's DNA. When I started at the Financial Health Network, formerly CFSI, over five years ago, financial health was still a really new term being rolled out and tested by just a few organizations here and there. And it's since taken root in, in ways that we could have scarcely imagined back then, finding its way into boardrooms, strategy documents, communications, and much more. And in some truly wonderful cases, we're now seeing it show up as part of an organization's brand promise and positioning, which feels like such a critical milestone in the mission to improve financial health for all. My guest today is Scott Sanborn, the truly thoughtful and visionary CEO of Lending Club, who has led the organization through a brand evolution and recently announced a brand promise as a financial health brand. Scott, I'm so excited to spend some time with you today to learn about this positioning and to hear a little bit more about your journey and how it's impacted your approach to your work as well as um, how it's affected your workforce. So thanks so much for joining me. Well, thank you for having me and, and you guys have been an important part of the journey. That's so great. Well, I mean, we'll kick right off. We've only got 20 minutes and a million things to talk about, so we'll get going. Um, let's start at the beginning. Like, tell me a little bit about your brand journey um, and what sort of brought you to the evolution and the announcement and the positioning of financial health um, and, and sort of what that means for you as an organization. Yeah, so, you know, we started uh, back in, you know, 2007 was our first loan. It was a pretty broad hypothesis, just hey, retail banking, one of the last categories to be disrupted by technology. We think, you know, credit's a data problem. Tech company can be positioned to solve that. And if you start with a customer first mindset, you'll be able to really, you know, work on the experience. So that's, that's really where we started. And that turned out to be true uh, in, in the sense of we, you know, launched uh, with a great product that won a lot of, you know, rave reviews from customers and you know got us going and as we started to get to a place where okay how do we get to scale what's the right product market fit we found that the number one use case for our product was helping people refinance their credit card debt effectively lower the cost of their debt and get on a path to getting out of debt and um, the more we learned about the customer and that use case, the more amazed we were. And, you know, there's this perception uh, that credit card debt only affects low-income borrowers. And the reality is, is that the difference in your income, of, the higher your income, effectively the higher credit card debt you have on average. And that's true all the way up to the top 10% of uh, the American population income earners. So the first 90% higher the income, higher the credit card debt. And you know, if you have high cost debt, uh, that likely means you don't have uh, sufficient savings. And if you don't have savings, you're at risk of getting caught in a cycle of debt, not being ready for retirement, and all the rest. So you know, the more we ended up learning and looking at the data, the more we were internally coming to the conclusion that you know, we talk a lot about the climate crisis mm -hmm. uh, and you know we see a real impending financial health crisis um, two-thirds of the country is deemed financially unhealthy that's your data uh, mm -hmm. based on having insufficient savings insufficient insurance protection all the rest so we just started talking more and more about it and incorporating it more and more into our activities that's awesome. And I think that, um, you know, we talked a little bit or we talk a little a lot about what's implementation versus talk. Right. And I think you just gave a couple of really good examples. But do you have a couple of other concrete examples of sort of where you've said this is we're going to put this out here. This is a promise. What are we going to do to back it up? You know, I, I mean, personally, I see an example. You actually have a financial health role right at the organization that's pretty high up in the C-suite. Um, and so what are some other examples of key product decisions or other ways of kind of practicing what you're preaching on the outcomes um, of financial health? Yeah. So, you know, what we've found is that 
in our business, this doesn't have to be like an either or. Either we're helping the customer do something or we have a good business. And in fact, uh, you know, there's, you know, lots of opportunity and that's what we're focused on is alignment between positive outcome for the company, positive outcome for, for our members. And, you know, one of the most powerful examples was, as I mentioned, when we saw, okay, people are using this to pay down credit card debt. Uh, and guess what? For the people who actually do pay down their credit card debt, we see a better outcome. We see their FICO score goes up, usually 20, 30 uh, points, and you know their overall uh, revolving debt, so their high cost debt, but you know it's kind of the, the saturated fat of debt, right? It's unhealthier debt because of the, the cost and the revolving nature, that goes down. So one of the things, and, and by the way, they perform better on the loan, <laughs> you know, lower delinquency rates, higher repayment rates. So we created uh, effectively a, a balance transfer process as part of the loan application that says, hey, are you going to use this to pay down credit card debt? Great. Which of your credit cards do you want us to pay down for you? We, rather than give you the money and put the work on you to do it, we're going to make it easy for you to do what you set out to do by doing it directly. Um, and in exchange for you doing that, we know you're going to perform better on the loan, so we will give you a lower rate. So we're both making it easier for you and we're giving you the benefit, right? You doing this is better for your financial health and therefore uh, you get a benefit. And so there we're winning. We get a better quality loan for the people that are investing in loans, including Lending Club, and the customer gets a lower cost of debt. So that, that's, uh, that's a perfect example of it, but still lots more work to do. Yeah, but it's a great start, obviously, and and being able to talk about it right publicly about you know what are some of the ways that you're looking at those outcomes and measuring it and sort of thinking about it beyond the traditional metrics of of, of business success, I think is really interesting. Um, so I want to just shift for a minute to talk a little bit about um, how the positioning has been received, right? I, I think that um, when you go out really publicly with that sort of evolution and that pivot. Um, there's a lot of different audiences for that, right? There's people who are looking at it from the media. There's people that are obviously looking at it from, you know, shareholder perspective, but there's your workforce. Like, how do you, how is it received, generally speaking, and how have you kind of dealt with that um, as you continue to work on your strategic plans? Yeah, so I'm glad you brought up that, you know, the, the level of visibility and the reception really varies pretty much by, by audience. So I guess starting with employees and, you know, employees today can choose to work wherever they want and having a company that actually has a mission that people respond to is, is important. So we, um, when, you know, as we became more and more passionate about this, we, we actually sat down and said, okay, let's, put together a brand promise that reflects what we're trying to do. And so our brand promise is to champion the financial success of our customers with fairness, simplicity, and heart. And all of those words are important. Um, so we're not saying we're achieving financial success because you know what, we're one piece of this ecosystem. We can't help if your income is volatile. We can't help if your, in your income is insufficient to cover your debts. But what we can do is give you a fair product that you understand that is better than the alternatives out there. And we can make it easy for you to do that. So that's what we mean by champion. And the, the fairness is, is back to it's a fair product. It's not free. There, there are costs associated, but it's fair. Um, and uh, simplicity is, uh, I gave it just recently example, how do we make it really easy for you to do the right thing? And heart is about treating people as people. And so we rolled that out to our employees uh, that it resonated immediately. Uh, every, like there was no debate. I mean, the process of coming up with the brand, pro brand promise was literally like two weeks mm -hmm. because it was so clearly right for us. Um, and it's provided a very helpful lens for employees to say, what is on brand? What is off brand, both in terms of our product innovation and, um, you know, our, our services. And so examples would be, you know, one of the next products we launched was auto refinance. Why? Because for our customers, auto represents their second largest purchase. And there's a structural unfairness in that market, which is if you buy your car at a used car dealer, you're paying more than you need to. It's your, your payment amount is not just based on your risk. 
It's based on fees that get added in that are invisible to you. Um, and so, and you know, it was also a driver uh, partially the acquisition of Radius Bank that we recently announced because they have a digital checking product that rewards you for using your debit card. So it rewards you for using money you have as opposed to rewarding you to go into debt. Hmm. So real clarifying lens for employees. It means that things don't have to be driven top down. People understand bottoms up what to do. But different stakeholders perceive it uh, differently. So for shareholders, I would say, honestly, it varies. Mm -hmm. uh, increasingly, we're a little behind Europe. Uh, ESG issues, right? Social issues are becoming important to shareholders. So us, you know, for those shareholders being able to share, hey, this is what we're doing. We're making credit more affordable. We're making it more accessible. Uh, and we're helping people improve their financial condition. That can really matter. For other investors, what they care about is show me the financials, show me the, show me the growth. Yeah, no, understood. And it also occurs to me that, you know, sort of coming out among the first sort of large organizations or institutions that's taking the financial health into their brand, um, there may be a perception of, oh, are we just trying to own it? Is this an exclusive? Um, but you know, even in past discussions with you, it's pretty clear that you see this as a large tent, right? Um, no one organization can own this brand um, of being a financial health company. And so, uh, you know, it'd be interesting for me to hear. Do you do you get into conversations with other leaders about this? Like, are you um, are you getting any questions about how that's resonating? We're particularly interested just to understand: Are we going to see more of this? And do you think that that's going to really start to 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 change the tide? So, you know, I, I guess starting with, um, you know, the question of, gosh, is this space too crowded? Does somebody own it? No, nobody's going to own this. Um, you know, just like nobody owns having food that's good for you, right? Uh, <laughs> um, and, and, and I would also separate out the mission of the company and the orientation of what kind of products and services you want to deliver to your customer versus your marketing materials, right? Mm -hmm. We don't, um, our advertising doesn't say, come to Lending Club because we're going to improve your financial health. Our advertising says, hey, you didn't pay off your credit card last month, which means you have a loan and it's not a good one. We're going to give you one that is lower cost, better for your FICO score and gets you out of debt faster. Mm -hmm. So that's what our advertising says. It's much more concrete. So I'd distinguish between how we think about ourselves and our mission versus how we're messaging customers, right? It's kind of like within a restaurant telling people we're going to have the healthiest food might not actually drive a bunch of people, but having a restaurant that has healthy food, puts calorie counts on the menu so that you can make right choices um, uh, is, is probably going to be a better business outcome while still delivering a good outcome for, for the customer. Mm -hmm. So we are, you know, thankfully seeing more people talking about this. Um, and that's great because the problem is massive. I mean, I don't need to, to tell you, Laura, the problem is massive. No one company is going to solve this. And, you know, the, the entrance of a lot of fintechs, ourselves included, are starting to chip away at some of the practices that, um, that help create bad outcomes for customers. You know, there's been a lot of press recently about, you know, banks moving away from charging, charging overdraft fees, which, you know, that's mm -hmm. what, that's our product as well. Uh, because 8% of the customers pay like 80 or 90% of the overdraft fees. Um, yeah. And it's, you know, it is deeply unfair to that segment and there are better solutions available. So people are talking about it. More importantly, people are making changes like the one I just indicated, uh, but yeah. it's, uh, we are still very early in the journey and the problem is quite, quite significant. Yeah, yeah, no, absolutely. Um, so I want to just shift back a little bit to the idea of outcomes, right, and holding yourselves accountable. And I know, you know, most organizations, yours included, are still at the beginning part of a journey of kind of measuring and understanding like a, a, a KPI, right, to what financial health really looks like. Um, can you talk just a little bit about what some of your thoughts are there and what your plans are, how you're going to start, you know, measuring the outcomes and what, how that's going to play into your reporting and, and so forth? Yeah, so we're we uh, I would agree we're we're at the, at the beginning, but we're making good progress. We're very excited about the, the path ahead. So for us, 
The big change for us is by acquiring a bank charter and giving us the ability to deliver banking services, such as you know, checking accounts, we have the ability to affect people beyond a transaction, right? Well, our core product is great. We're going to lower your cost of debt, improve your FICO score. But what happens two years later, it's sort of out of our hands, right? Um, and what we've seen is we lower your debt, we improve your FICO score, you get buried with new credit card offers. And, you know, not everybody is able to resist those and stay out. So with the addition of the bank and the checking account, we're going to have the ability to stay with our customers ongoing. We're going to have insights into um, spend, into income patterns, and we're going to have visibility to addition and the opportunity to find additional ways to help them, right? So we'll be able to see what's happening and say, hey, your payment date just changed. Maybe you should use your mortgage, move your mortgage date so that it corresponds to when you get paid. Mm -hmm. um, so we are in, in anticipation of that future. We have built uh, dashboards um, that are, are meant to measure a set of defined metrics over time to uh, measure a customer's health. So we're looking at things like FICO scores, total unsecured debt, revolving debt balances, so that we can track people over time. Um, and now that we have the ability to communicate more easily with them, we think we'll be able to drive a differentiated, uh, a differentiated outcome. Yeah, and I, I can say even just on a personal level that having the, that information and getting in a place where you can share that right broadly just to show the connections right of all of the different types of um, activity and financial situations that people are in, how it just affects certain stages of their lives. I think that's going to be massively powerful um, because we we do live in a in a place right now where we see a certain snapshot, and that's the snapshot that we focus on. And so I think what you're doing here is kind of creating a bigger a bigger 3D. So yeah, I know bigger 3D and making it a customer centric as opposed to product centric. So what can very easily happen at large organizations is people get siloed, you know, the people doing mortgages are just trying to sell mortgages and the people doing auto loans are just trying to sell auto loans and, yeah. and, you know, and so on and so on and so on. And so the aggregate impact of what's happening with the customer can get lost. So we're really excited and, you know, was real work to kind of make it customer centric and be able to see how different products over time influence them and different, you know, nudges and communications will be able to influence them. That's great. Well, with only just a couple minutes left, I will leave you with the question of if there are other leaders out there who are considering a brand um, shift or thinking about integrating financial health a little bit more visibly, what what kind of advice would you give them? Any tips on how to approach that? Yeah, I mean, I, I think the big question is, is your customer better or worse off for having interacted with you than if they didn't? Um, and, you know, it feels like a simple question, but it, it's actually not. And I don't know that everybody, everybody's asking it, right? right? You know, how do you measure that over what time frame? Are there certain practices you're engaged in that, you know, um, are good business, but might actually be creating a bad outcome for the customer? And is there a situation that you helped create uh, that led to a bad outcome? So, um, you know, I, I think it is a very, very worthwhile topic. And again, it over the long term, it is good business. But if you look at our business and you know, this is some information we've shared publicly, it's part of our journey to focus on membership as opposed to a customer in a transaction and rewarding people for doing good things. Mm -hmm. um, we also reward people when they come back. We recognize you. As a member, the process is that much easier. Your rate is that much better. So half of our customers come back to us within yeah. five years um, yeah. to do business with us again, right? Yeah. And they're able to do business with us because they're in a good shape, right? And yeah. because yeah. we delivered on their behalf. So it, it is not, you know, this is not, this does not require you to be a nonprofit. Yeah. <laughs> um, well, I really appreciate that. And I will say that you know, very thankful that there are folks like you out there and leaders like you out there thinking about this. Um, 
and um, I would just encourage folks, I know people have been putting things in the chat and thank you so much and we'll answer as much as we can um, and also refer if we, if we can to be helpful. Um, but I just wanted to say thank you so much for joining us and for sharing that. It was a really wonderful, inspiring conversation. All right, thanks for having me. Thank you.